So I'm going to explain how to use the rubric to get maximum grade. Section 1, defining the problem and selecting the variables. You must make sure that your research question is appropriate. What do we mean by an appropriate research question? We must have an independent variable and a dependent variable. By an independent variable, we mean a variable that you are going to change. So, for example, mass, the mass of the cones, you, um, the height you drop them from, or the shape. The dependent variable, then, is the variable that you measure. So, in this case, it would either be time, if you're looking at how fast it will fall, or, in a few cases, speed. But in order to work out speed, you have to do an extra calculation, which I haven't taught you. So you need to stick with these two. Now, that's not the only thing you have to do. You also need to make sure it's appropriate. That means you need to make sure that the sentence makes sense. So don't sh just say, how does the shape affect time? You need to make a full statement. How does the shape of the cone affect the time it takes it to fall? So make it a full statement that anybody can understand. The next thing is to state your hypothesis. Now a hypothesis mentions the dependent variable and the independent variable as well. So in your hypothesis you're going to say how will the independent variable affect the dependent? Will it make it go faster? Will it make it the time go longer? But again, make it a full sentence. So how will the independent variable affect the dependent variable and the answer would be the hypothesis the height of the cone will make the time it takes to drop longer again answer your your research question fully in a long sensible statement you do also, if you can, need to give some science theory. Now, in this particular experiment, I haven't taught you the science theory yet, so you don't need to do it just yet. Okay, so you can ignore that. If you want to um, state your independent and dependent variables separately, nice and clearly, so they're easy to find, that's also a plus. Now we're going to go on to the next section, controlling the variables. Methods need to be so clear that your method could be followed by somebody you've never met before just by reading your report. It's not that it has to be long, you just have to have some very specific things in it. Now a good way to make your method clear is to use bullet points. Write things as a list, okay, as if you were writing a recipe. Your scientific diagram must also be very clear. And I think I've mentioned it before, but there are a few ways you can do this. You can take a photo and label the different parts. The photo should be such that you can see what measurements are being taken. To so maybe have somebody at the maximum height holding the cone, and then you can add an arrow to show that that's the height that has to be measured, and have somebody else holding a stopwatch. You can take a picture or take a, f um, a diagram from the internet but you must cite. Okay, you must cite your work, otherwise you won't get this mark. The third thing is to draw it using the draw functions on Word. There's lots of like from squares and straight lines, you can probably do your own. Or the third one is to scan a hand drawing. Okay, all of these are valid. Once you've done your scientific diagram, you need to talk about how to actually do this experiment setup. One of the most important things that you must say is how you're going to collect and measure the independent variable. In the case of the mass of the cone, you would need to say out exactly how you're going to control the mass. Sometimes it could be um, measuring out masses of plasticine of 50 grams each. Um, and collect five of them. If it's the height, it might be to measure with a ruler and mark five different heights. 
if it's five different shapes, then you would have to basically state that you're measuring the cone area or the cone diameter with a ruler and say how you made the different sizes. Okay, so the important thing is that you mention the variable height, mass, shape, and you say with what object you're going to measure it. The same with a dependent variable. How are you going to measure your dependent variable? Is it with a stopwatch? If it is, then you need to say so. I will time how long it takes to drop. But drop the measured distance, or drop from start to finish. Or you can even say, I will start my stopwatch when the person drops it or gives me a signal and stop it when it lands. Be as specific as possible. The next very important thing is the control variables. These are all the variables that must stay the same. So if you're changing mass, you have to keep the height the same. How will you do that? And that's what you need to do in this next bit. There are some control variables that, which will have a massive effect on your experiment. So if you're doing mass of the cone, height and shape will have a huge influence. So you must keep them the same. Mention these first. And then there are extra variables that will affect your experiment. Wind flowing through the window, pressure of the air, temperature. All of these things might have a very small effect, but although they might be worth mentioning, it's not so important that you state how you control them. Okay, What's important is that you control the variables that will affect your experiment by a huge amount. Okay, so to sum up, when controlling your variables, when writing a method, it's important that you state your variables and how, with what object, you're going to measure them in as much detail as possible. Right, let's talk about recording our data. This is really straightforward. You need a nice results table with all your results. Okay, so you need your repeat, readings 1, readings 2, and your average. These are super important. Always remember the units. So if it's centimetres, 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 and you write them at the top. Okay, so you get two marks for using a table and using the correct table headings. And then for repeat readings, you get another two if you work out the averages, which is a bonus. Then presenting the data. You must always try and do a graph which will ensure that you get a line relationship. This you get by choosing variables that you are changing by measurable amounts. So not just the size of the cone, small and to big, but actually measuring the size of the cone in centimetres. Okay, so those of you who've done that, you've measured the diameter. This gives you line graphs. So choosing the correct, gra draw, choosing the correct graph means, have you done an experiment that will give you a line graph, basically? Have you drawn your axes and have you labelled them? So you must ensure that you have labelled axes with the quantity. So it could be time in seconds and say cone size in centimetres. Cone size in centimetres. Okay. And then that you have a line of best fit if it's relevant or if you need to do a curve. A little bit harder, but you've got a curve in there. Okay, so that's three very easy to achieve marks. Now concluding, this is where it starts to get a bit challenging. The first thing that you must do is to go back to your research question, all the way over here, so it was ages ago, and you make sure that you've answered it. Okay, so regardless of what it was, you make a statement answering that research question. Then you use your results. Now you can do that by using your results table and actually adding numbers to your explanation. Or you can use the results from your graph. Now a straight line is a very important pattern, as is a curve. So if you get a straight line or a curve, it's important that you mention this in your results in order to justify a conclusion. If you increase the size of the cone, as we can see here, the cone height is getting bigger and the time increases by the same amount, there's a very, very important pattern. So you need to state this. The relationship shows a straight line graph because 
the cone size is increasing the time regularly. There are always errors though. It's fine if you have some of those errors around the line, it's still okay to mention the straight line. However, if you get a graph that's a bit of a mess and has a line but dots all over the place, it's not okay to say that you have a straight line relationship. You'd have to say that your results, although they show that it's increasing, do not give you much of a pattern. That's also important as well. The last bit, theory used in conclusion, is the last thing that we're going to do. So when you finish writing up your report, we'll go over the theory and we'll see if we can add a theory to help justify our conclusion later. Evaluating is the most challenging part. Try and think of everywhere in your experiment where you did things that would affect your results. Whenever you're using a stopwatch, you have an issue called reaction time. Okay, Reaction time is because it takes your brain quite a few like microseconds to react to what it's seeing, but that still has an effect. You're never going to time exactly when you should. However, this is a what we call a systematic error. It's an error that always happens by the same amount every time that you do it. There are other errors just by not paying attention. In order to do an experiment exactly, you would have to make sure that every single aspect of what you're doing is done accurately and carefully. And I don't think there was much evidence of that. So don't be afraid to be honest and confess where you could have done things better. The first part is to name all these things that we've done wrong. We have a reaction time. I'm going to give you this example. That would be a limitation. Okay, this is a very bad picture of a stopwatch. And then you need to mention realistic improvements. Okay. So in order to decrease reaction time, you'd have to try and figure out a different way of measuring the time that doesn't involve a stopwatch and you pressing the button. A lot of people use video cameras now. Video cameras have a timer on them. So as you watch, you film the object dropping and you look at the timer, it should be able to tell you when the timing, when the actual cone reaches the floor. Now this is just one example of a weakness and an improvement. You get maximum credit for kind of, I'd say at this stage, three weaknesses and three improvements. And then lastly, don't forget to go back to your prediction and say if you got it correct or not. Okay? So you'd go all the way back up here and you would say, yes, my prediction was correct or no, it wasn't. It would be a good time to mention as well, where did your prediction come from? Was it scientific or was it something that you guessed? If you finish this section here, the theory used in conclusion, that will help you answer this section properly. Now, manipulative skills, this is something I'm going to be assessing a lot more carefully from now on, is how have you used your experiment well? If your results give you a graph that's a complete mess, I know for a fact that you haven't necessarily used your equipment well. So this is something you're going to have to be careful from, from now on. Okay, It's important to try and make an attempt to be careful. Not just so that you don't have so many weaknesses and limitations that your experiment goes completely wrong, but it's also so you get these two marks and that you've worked independently. I think most of you have done a good job. Safety issues, there aren't many at this stage, but anything you can think of will be counted as credit. Okay, so if there are any other questions, you can email me and I'll try and send another video to help.